woman. In the whole of the 27 books of the New Testament, not once does he call his mother, mother. Woman, woman. I'm asking in the Hebrew language, is there no word for mother? This word woman he uses for the prostitute. Same word. You see the woman who was caught, caught in the act. They bring her to Jesus. He said, look, this woman, we caught her in the act. What must we do to her? They're putting him to the test. They're trying to get him embroiled with the government or with the religious authorities. Either way, he loses. If he says, stone her, that was the law, book of Leviticus, that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. If he says, stone her as a man of God, he must abide by the law. Stone her. And they would have stoned her and killed her. And if they were apprehended by the law, by the government, they said, look, our Messiah told us to. This is what our Messiah said. So he's in conflict with the government. Because adultery was not a capital crime in the Roman Empire, nor is it today in Christendom. It is not a crime at all. Adultery is no crime. Did you know that? Adultery is not a crime in any Christian nation on earth. It's not a crime. The law will not hold you responsible for committing adultery. He calls the prostitute woman. Where are thine accusers? So he says, no, they are all gone. So he says, all right, go and sin no more. Woman. He says, there's not a single place he calls his mother, mother, in the Bible. So he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. So she persuades him. He says, look, man, help them out. These people are in difficulty. He says, all right, fill up the vats. You know, the wine vats with water. And they fill it up. And he turned the water into wine. And they drank. And they remarked, the drunkards of the night who have been drinking, imbibing all night. They're remarking, why have you kept the best wine for the last? The best wine, why have you kept it to the last? So my brother Jimmy Swaggart, he says in his book that that wine was pure grape juice. I said, brother, I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but I said, brother, Swaggart, you see if a man has an imbibing wine, for whole night and the things run dry and you give him pure grape juice that grape juice is like mud water to him because there is a law involved you drink five percent alcoholic drink five percent five percent after a while your senses are getting dulled you need ten percent to make you feel that it's alcohol something to give you a kick then you need twenty percent to make you to feel that there's something potency in it you have to increase the alcoholic content to make you feel that it's better than the previous one, it's better than the previous one. If you give such a man grape juice, he says it's mud water, what is it? Insipid, no taste. <laughs> and he's telling us in his book called Alcohol, this is one of the, he's telling us, and I have no reason to contradict him unless you have, he said there are 11 million drunkards in America, 11 million drunkards. And 44 million heavy drinkers. Get that book, small book. I have a sample here, I think. Alcohol. 11 million drunkards and 44 million heavy drinkers. And he says, to me, there's no difference between the two. It means 55 million drunkards, as far as Jimmy Swaggart is concerned. In my country, they don't call them drunkards. It's an insult. The guy can punch you on the jaw if you call a man a drunkard. You have to call him alcoholic. You know, the poor man is sick. She's a sickness in his treatment. It's not a sin. Alcohol is not a sin. It's a sickness. Jimmy Swaggart calls a spade a spade. He said, drunkards. 55 million drunkards in America. 11 million drunkards and heavy drinkers. I said, I make no difference. I said, yes, brother. I said, go a step further. Islam will take you a step further. He said, even your social drinkers are on the same level. They're breaking the laws and commandments of God as given in the last and final revelation of God. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot. The Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, O you who believe, innam al khamru, most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru, and gambling, wal ansabu, and fortune telling, wal aslamu, and idol worship, rizum minam al shaitan, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork, fachtani buhu la allakum tuflihun. It's a shun such abomination that you may prosper. And one pronouncement, he created the biggest society of teetotalers in the world. 1,000 million Muslims, as a people, as a whole, they don't imbibe that filth. 
We have our black sheep. We are not all angels. We know some Muslims can drink the Christian under the table. That you know. We are ashamed of them. But as a people as a whole, the biggest society of teetotalists, people who don't imbibe, are the Muslims. And what did it? This word of God. This is a miracle. You perform a million miracles and you can't change people. Here, without any miracles, he transforms nations. This is a miracle. What miracle are you talking about? So, the Quranic first miracle of Jesus, he spoke and defended his mother against an unbelieving audience. The first miracle of Jesus, he turned water into wine. Since then, wine has flowed like water in Christendom. And there's no way out. The preachers, Jimmy Swaggart is telling us, there's a book called Preachers. And he's telling us in that book, he said they at a church conference, all these preachers, the evangelists, the hot gospelers, the Bible thumpers. You know what they call them evangelists? Born again Christians? Yes. At a conference, they asked, somebody suggested this, look, those people who are against, the, 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 against alcohol, please stand up, that you can go out when you return, preach in your churches against the evil of alcohol. Please stand up. And Jimmy Swaggart says, nobody stood up. That means they all opted for alcohol. Why? And the reason, Jimmy Swaggart said, the reasoning is, he said, look, our Lord Jesus turned water into wine. If it is good enough for our God, it's good for us. Good logic. If it's good for your God, it's good for you. He says, that was pure grape juice. I said, it is the same W-I-N-E wine, your Christian scholar says, W-I-N-E wine in Greek as the Lot the prophet Lord, according to the Bible, he drank and cohibited with his daughters, committed incest night after night. Same W-I-N-E wine in Greek, that W-I-N-E wine and this W-I-N-E wine. I said, the only way out is, here, the last and final revelation of God, Jesus Christ tells you that I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity. You're not fit to receive solution to all the problems that I can give you. I can give, solve all the problems of mankind till doomsday, but you are not fit. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he said, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit of truth, for he shall not speak from himself, but what things so shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. He said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And he truly glorified Jesus by absolving him from the calumnies of his enemies, his mother as well as Jesus. And the Christian world can never repay Muhammad for what he has done. What Muhammad has done for Jesus and for his mother. He is the true comforter, the true advocate of Jesus Christ. With these words, Mr. Chairman, I don't see the chairman around, but Mr. Chairman and my dear brethren, I stop here and give you the opportunity, as was uh, suggested by the chairman, that you have a time, you have the opportunity of asking questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dieter, for this inspiring talk. I will now give a one-minute outline for the lecture for those who came late. Mr. Dida started talking about the legitim legitimacy and the illegitimacy of the both children of Abraham, and then he talked about how the Jews looked down the Arabs 1,300 years ago, and they are still looking down at the Arabs now. He went further and he talked about Mary and her status, that he, she was not being married before the birth of Jesus, and how miraculously Jesus was born. He went again and he talked about the importance of believing on Jesus as an apostle in the Muslim point of view. In Islam, a Muslim is not a Muslim unless he believes that G Jesus, peace be with him, is a messenger of Allah. He explained uh, also, he talked about alcohol and the problems of gambling, fortune telling and the problems of all the problems that mankind suffer and he showed both the viewpoints of Islam and what he had discussed with uh, Mr. Fuagat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are not here to antagonize anybody, not to belittle any religion, caste, or creed. 
we are here to learn and to get the benefit of the talk. Uh, Mr. Didat will now entertain questions and he will answer questions. If you have any question, please feel free and come to the mic. According to the Quran, and I'll, I'll admit, admit an, an ignorance of the Quran, okay? Uh, was Jesus resurrected from the dead? The question was, according to the Quran, was Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead? Now, according to the Quran, he was neither killed nor crucified. See, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa qawlihim inna qatanna al-Masiha Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. That they said in boast that we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. In answer to that, God says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ That they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ But it was made to appear to them so. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمْ They have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَى الزَّنْ They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَقِينًا For a surety, they killed him not. And I'm going to have a debate with a great Christian in your country of the Zwemer Institute, I think the night after tomorrow or tomorrow night in Kansas, uh, Dr. Robert Douglas on the subject of was Christ crucified. And I will prove from the Christian Bible, not from the Quran. The Quran says they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. We are satisfied. But no, to satisfy the Christian, uh, I will show to them from the Christian Bible that, brothers, you have misunderstood the whole thing. You are reading something and actually you are misunderstanding it. And I will be proving that tomorrow night. Is it tomorrow night? Uh, tomorrow night in Kansas City, we are having a debate with um, Robert Douglas, Dr. Robert Douglas of the Zwemer Institute. We will deal with this subject fully there. Now the gentleman on the left. Less than uh, a year ago, two of my dear friends were thrown into prison in a large Muslim country for talking to Muslims about Jesus. Indeed, in most countries that are predominantly Muslim, one cannot go and freely talk about Jesus without the fear of prison or even death. Question How can Islam be true if it cannot stand up in the marketplace of ideas without the protection of a gun or prison? Indeed, does not the truth welcome criticism and debate? I would kindly request whoever asked a question to limit the question to the merit of the discussion. However, I will give Mr. Didet a chance to answer this question. But whoever has a question, please limit it, because Mr. Didet here is not to defend what governments are doing. He is only here to explain what he explained already. Now, Mr. Didet. See, the question is quite a rhetoric one about Muslim governments, their policies with regards to people coming in and perverting their people. From the point of view of the Muslim, is a perversion. From the worship of the one good, true God, people want to take away our children and worship human beings, created beings. To us, it is the highest form of blasphemy. Worship, instead of worshiping God, worshiping his creation, creatures. So if the governments are trying to defend, I'm not defending them, but I said if they are trying to defend in the best interest of the people, that is their business. But now, at the same time, it also poses another question from my side, that the Christian missionaries, you'll have to now acknowledge that they're using deceitful methods, deceitful. Look at this. Look at this. This book here. No Muslim child will ever think that this is Christian. Look at this. Al-Kitab, Arabic calligraphy. You see, deceiving the Muslims in the guise of Islamic book, this. At close view, if you have, you see, you know, how easily the Muslim is t being taken up by this. Al-Kitab. This calligraphy is Islamic, but actually is the Gospel of St. Matthew. Can you imagine? Deceit. Now, I want to know whether your Christianity allows you to deceive people. In Pakistan, on my way, I delivered a lecture. While I am walking out, people all around, they surround me, they're shaking hands, you know, congratulating me. A small boy, about 12 or 14, he comes to me and he presents these three to me. This. This. Look at this. He presents this to me. I take it, 
I felt like kissing it, that's our habit. You know, Allah's kalam, if you come across, we kiss it, but the crunch was too great, people, you know. So I put it quickly in my pocket. For about three to four days, I had no chance of taking it out. Believe me, I'm not exaggerating. You know, I'm moving from place to place, I have no time. When I go to the hotel, I'm tired, I take off my jacket and throw it down one side. Then in Abu Dhabi or somewhere, I took it out and put this on my t table next to the bed. Still, I'm not looking what it is, what it is. Then now, to move further, I said, now let me weed out all these papers that I've collected. And I start looking at this. I'm reading. Allah Muhammad. Look at it. Allah Muhammad. I'm reading. Allah Muhammad. Mm. I turn the back, it's calendar. Another one. Beautiful calligraphy. Islamic calligraphy. Look at this. In a hundred years, the Muslim child will never know what he's harboring in his house. Sticker, beautiful sticker. He's going to stir this out and put it in the Quran. Stick it in the Quran. You know what? Deceit. Christian missionaries, this is what they're doing to our people now. Deceiving them. This one here. He says, back of it, he said, the Lord's Prayer. He said, Lord's Prayer? We don't talk like that. The Lord's Prayer says, Al-Fatiha. We say Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen, opening chapter, the Lord's Prayer. So what's this? Abbana, Ab ah, say, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in Arabic. Calligraphy, deceitful. You see what you're doing? Deceiving the people. This one here is not Allah Muhammad. For a week I couldn't see it. Look at this. Everybody says Allah Muhammad. Am I right? What do you see? It's not Allah Muhammad. It's Allah Muhabbah. God is love. Deceiving people. I ask you, my brother missionary. You see, you're protesting. I said, look, is this your way of propagating your faith? If you have something good, something, why don't you go out openly and talk to them? Give them your calligraphy, your language. Why? What are you trying to catch fish with? What are you doing now? Deceiving people. And here, yeah, another one. Coming from Ghana, a letter addressed to the Arab countries. I must read it to you. I must read it to you. What they are trying to do now. They are sending parcels, literature, into Muslim countries. And on the top of it, they put rubber stamps. This is asking now, do you think that if I send you bigger parcels, about twice or thrice the size, size sizes I sent you with our franking stamp, which has the name Islamic Madrasatul, Islamic Madrasatul. I don't know what it really means. But as soon as the postman, the government man sees the Islamic Madrasatul inside. Your religion allows you to deceive people like that? In the guise of, you know, Jesus Christ truly described them. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. They're trying to deceive you. You must be beware of them. So, brother, I'm not defending my Arab brothers. In Pakistan, you have the freedom there. Pakistan, your missionaries are making inroads. In Bangladesh, you have the freedom there. In India, you have the freedom there. See? In Indonesia, Malaysia, you have the freedom there. If some Arabs, you know, are more stringent in the regulations, but you're still getting through. Look, by deceit, by post, by radio, you're getting through. So what are you complaining about? What is your complaint? We have a legitimate complaint. Books that the Christians write. Every book. Inside, why I became a Christian. Sultan Muhammad Paul. When you flip the pages, verses from the Quran. For the Muslim, these verses are sacred, sacrosanct. Every child, every grown-up will kiss it and put it next to the Quran. Why? Because Allah's kalam is, he will not tear it, he will not burn it. You know the psychology of the Muslim and you're taking unfair advantage of it. Look at this. From Sufism to Islam, John Abdul Subhan. Look at this. Deceit? Does your religion allow you to deceive people like this? Catching fish? No, you tell me. So what are you crying about? What are you complaining about? In Africa, you have 35,000 full-time crusaders. Billy Graham, I'm sorry, Jimmy Swaggart, he's boasting that he's getting th through to 22 million Muslims through his radio service, 22 million. I'm asking, what are you crying about? Please.
don't, you know, like, you know, bashful maidens, you know, when you do the things, you're hurting the people's feelings, you're trying to steal our children, and now, when somebody tries to do some type of protection, you're wearing like a woman. Please don't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole lecture will be available on a cassette tape, and it could be uh, available at the Islamic Center of Tucson, address 1627 East First Street, Tucson, Arizona, 85719, and the telephone number there is 325-8992. Repeat, the address is 1627 East First Street, Tucson, Arizona, and the zip code is 85719. And not only this lecture is available there, you could request several lectures of Mr. Didet and some other scholars also, if you want to broaden your background about this. Uh, also, we have about 15 more minutes for the questions and answers. You are kindly requested. If you have any question, please feel free and come to the mic. Now the gentleman on the right can start. First of all, I'd like to clarify a point. Um, Earlier on tonight, you made a statement involving incarnation, involving a comparison of Christianity with Hinduism. Well, to, to clarify a point, we do not believe that the purpose of Jesus Christ coming down in the form of man was for the simple reason of understanding man's problems, but instead to take on the sin of the world. And because of that, there is no real parallel between an incarnation of comparing Hinduism faith with the faith of Christianity. And second, the point that I'd really like to address your entire issue tonight is that it seemed to me that it was more not necessarily who is Christ and what is his purpose but it was more like an attack upon men Christian men your men I mean I, I appreciate I appreciate Mohammed and I appreciate all the great prophets but it's God that is above all of us and you know, we really have no right to compare ourselves on the same standpoint. And so to bring in man versus man is really irrelevant when it comes to God and Christianity and the Muslim faith. And so I'd like to know not necessarily what you believe on the attack of a Jimmy Swaggart or a Pat Robertson or your own people, but instead I'd like to know where is it you stand on Jesus Christ in comparison to God and your Muslim faith in a comparison between faiths, not men. I thought I made it abundantly clear with regards to what we accept Jesus to be. I said, and I repeat, that Jesus Christ, we believe, was one of the mightiest messengers of God. I said, we believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern-day Christians don't believe today. We believe in his many miracles including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission and of healing bo those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Then I said, there is a parting of the ways. And that is, you say that he's God, we say he's not God. You say he's God incarnate, we say God does not incarnate. Is that an attack? Or is this putting forth to you our position, say, look, this is our position, instead of hypocritically telling you, you know, he performed many miracles and what he did and he spoke as a child and all that, and says, now I scratch your back and you scratch my back. Was that what I was trying to do? I said, look, we accept all these things. We are going together. Here is the parting of the ways. We say, he's not God and he's not God incarnate because God does not incarnate. And he's not the begotten son of God because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And we are not to attribute such a quality to God. Now, this is the Muslim stand. If that goes against your grain, against your belief, now you have every right to ask. Mr. D, that you see, Jesus is God. So what makes him God is he had no father. So some, every, every person must have a father. So I have to agree, yes. So Jesus must also have a father. So if you can't show a father, who is his father? I said, no, he has no father. He said, no, his father is God. What have you to say now? So he is the begotten son of God. He's God's only son. Talk like that. So what have you to say? We believe in the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You know, this is, this is what our book says now. Do you accept the Trinity? Talk like that. The first question, he did a beautiful job. He said, look now, we believe about Christ. Resurrection. 
So I said, look, if there's no death, there's no resurrection. Talk like that. Look, this is the question. They said, now you want me to justify, even now, you want me to justify. I said, look, I'll show you from your own book that you read something and you misunderstand the thing that you're reading. Let's put it to the audience. Let us put it to you. But now you, I said, you're crying now like a woman, you know, bashful maiden. You said, now look, you, said, you attack, what attack? What did I say disparaging about Jesus? You say that he called his mother woman in your book. I said, my book says, he says, Wabarram bi walidati. He says, made me kind to my mother. Wajalani jabbar and shakiya. And he's not made me, uh, oh, 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 oh. Wallam ajani jabbar and shakiya. And not, you know, uh, aggressive or uh, abusing. Look, this is the Quran is defending Jesus. That he never did any things that you are attributing to him. That he called the learned men of Israel. He's the elders of his people. You generation of wipers. You whited sepulchers. You wicked and adulterous generation. You snakes. You fools. Look, this is your record. My book says, no, he never did anything like that. Is that an attack? If that is an attack, then brother, you know, I apologize. By God. You know, I'm ashamed of myself. If this is an attack, the Quran says that he didn't do that. He respected his mother. That's an attack. Is that an attack? That he didn't abuse the people. Is that an attack? No, you must tell me what, what is the attack? What is the attack? What, what did I say abusive about Jesus? I say he's one of the mightiest messengers of God. We love him. We respect him. We revere him. And I, we say follow him. Follow him. He, because if you followed him, you'll be a Muslim. You're not following him. However, the opportunity to the questioners, please. Go ahead. Uh, in fact, uh, what I want to talk is the, oh, the my question is, uh, I believe all the gospel, the, the, the Torah, and the, the Quran itself. And the God also revealed the, the, the gospel and the, and the Bible and the Torah for guidance and light. But my question is, we see the error, or you pointed out the error of Christianity by saying that they worship according to the will of God. How about on the second side, on the other side of the coin, that also Muslim worship according the will of God by idolizing hadith, tales, all these things. Why don't we see on the other side also? Because these people, we say that we follow the Quran, but they follow hadith, tales, and narration of other people which are not the words of God, totality. How do you see these things? I, I, you see, I think you have missed the mark. What I, the subject was, I don't know whether you people know when you say the subject was two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and Biblical. Now the brother is coming out with something about the Muslims now, they're idolizing a book. Which book are they idolizing? Which book are you idolizing? Which book are you worshipping? We pray to Allah, we make salat, give zakat, go for pilgrimage, you know, we abstain from evil. I don't know what is the question. Where is what tro troubling you? I don't know. You see, the subject was about Jesus. Now you're talking about books and idolizing books. Which Muslim is worshipping a book? I want to know. Then I'll deal with that Muslim. But if you are that Muslim, then you tell me, which book are you idolizing? Okay, can I ask? Can I ask no, no, look, please. This was supposed to be question time. There are so many people behind you. Please give them an opportunity. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. My, my question is one of curiosity. If, if the Muslim believes in Jesus Christ as being a prophet, then I assume that means that they're revering his message and what he was. So my curiosity is one in the Christian description of him, say by the prophet Isaiah, when he's referred to as the coming Messiah being Emmanuel, translated as God with us, and also in the men that he was with, that he trained up, who, when they relate his story, relate frequent insta instances where he they say that no man comes to God but through me, and that I am the bread, the truth, the life, that I am God. So it's, I'm curious about how you handle that. It's a very, very pertinent and straightforward question. Straight request, you know, it calls for my response on that level. You see, uh, there are quotations in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament where a description is given about somebody, something, Maybe the Messiah, it says, and he shall be called, I'm quoting, called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He shall be called Emmanuel. 
I'm asking people, I said, look, you've got 27 books in the New Testament, 27 books. In any one of these books, is it ever mentioned anywhere that Jesus was ever called Emmanuel? Was he called Emmanuel? He was called Jesus. He was called the Messiah. He was called the bread of life. He was called the, <laughs> the truth of God. All that, the word of God. Was he ever called Emmanuel in any one of these 27 books? Was he? No. So it means he's not referring to him. He shall be called. Like you see, the man comes along, he's going to lecture to you people on the subject, uh, two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and Biblical, and that man shall be called the Messiah. Now, did anybody call me Messiah? No. So it's, there's no fulfillment. Can you see? If I wasn't called Messiah, I'm not the Messiah. He was called, and he, nobody ever called him. He shall be called. I said, you see, that refers to Muhammad. Because Muhammad, you see in the Quran, in the Holy Quran, you read, 